You're listening to the Books Track Audiobooks, the channel that brings you to grow up your mind. Myself HT Sony. And today we will listening The Hidden Brain by Shankar Vedantam. Chapter 4 The Infant State, Makaka and Racist Seniors, The Life Cycle of Bias. When my daughter was a few days old, I prowled back and forth in front of her as she lay swaddled in her bassinet. She watched. As I circled the room, she kept her eyes fixed on mine until the rim of the bassinet obscured her vision. The moment I reappeared, she homed in again. I wasn't being a proud father. I was conducting an experiment. If you know anything about infants, the fact that my daughter tracked my eyes as I walked around her room will not strike you as surprising. Indeed, her behavior will seem so commonplace that you might wonder why I mention it, or put it down to the usual vanity of parents who insist that ordinary things about their children are somehow extraordinary. The fact that infants are so adept at tracking their parents as they move about is actually quite extraordinary. It is also one of the earliest visible examples of the hidden brain at work. Without thought or effort, my daughter was doing something that has stumped supercomputers for years. Consider the problem from an engineering perspective. Let's say you want to design an intelligent camera to spot a pair of eyes. If the face is in front of you, you would teach the camera to locate two blobs that are symmetrically positioned on either side of the nose, once you teach the camera to recognize a nose. But faces are usually not in front of us. Most of the time, they are off to one side or another, displaced in any one of a thousand possible angles. Sometimes all we can see is a single eye. If a face should vanish and reappear, our camera would have to not only recognize that a face, and not a pumpkin, had come into view, but calculate at what angle the face was being presented. If the camera worked through trial and error, it might produce thousands of errors before it found the right answer. The reason my daughter tracked my eyes effortlessly is that she arrived in this world with the innate ability to distinguish faces and eyes from other objects. Brightly colored toys could capture her attention, but they were only interesting things in a world that awaited exploration. My face and eyes, on the other hand, were already meaningful. In the long journey of learning and survival that lay before her, my daughter's ability to lock eyes with me was a crucial step. The faces of her parents, after all, were not just objects in an object cluttered world, they were her link to food and water, to comfort, protection, and security. Babies the world over face radically different challenges for survival, but all the problems have the same solution, the loving attention of parents. The hidden brain is designed to preferentially recognize faces over other objects. Across generations, infants who formed a bond by locking onto the eyes of their parents were more likely to survive than infants who found trees or dogs or rocks more interesting. Italian researchers once showed that newborns who were just a day old preferred geometric shapes that resembled a human face over shapes that did not. It takes barely five hours of face-to-face -face time for an infant to develop a preferential attachment to her mother's face over that of a stranger. This is extraordinary when you consider how similar faces are to one another, and how limited and helpless newborn infants are in virtually every other domain of physical and mental performance. Our preferential ability to recognize faces, and certain faces, in particular, makes the human brain very different from a computer. My daughter's brain was designed to be biased, to pay attention to faces at the expense of other objects, and to some faces at the expense of others. You can see why such a bias is useful. As infants, it allows us to latch on to our parents. As children, it helps us recognize a friend across a crowded playground. As young adults searching for mates, it gives us the ability to make exquisitely sensitive distinctions in matters of beauty and attractiveness. Throughout life, faces are our guides to the feelings and predispositions of those around us, facial expressions let us know when our neighbor is upset. They tell us whether the cute sophomore is interested in going out on a date, they warn us about people who intend to do us harm. If you were designing a brain from scratch, you would want to bias it to pay attention to faces over other objects. In recent years, 
scientists have found an area in the brain, called the fusiform face area, that specializes in recognizing human faces. It is activated when we see a face, and also when we remember a face. Brain imaging studies show the fusiform face area is activated only by human faces, and not by other objects or by faces of other animals, and is sensitive to faces presented in full view, in profile, and as cartoons. This part of the hidden brain even lights up in response to two-tone pictures that provide minuscule amounts of information and that require us to mentally fill in a picture in order to recognize a face. The unconscious influence of the fusiform face area explains why people regularly see human faces in random patterns of nature. Shortly after Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein was executed in 2006, for example, many people in Iraq swore they saw the dictator's face imprinted on the moon. When I looked at a photograph of that moon over Iraq, it took me a few seconds to spot Saddam Hussein's visage, but there it was, all right, his eyes, nose, even his mustache. The coincidence said less about the supernatural than about the way the hidden brain has a systematic bias to recognize anything that looks like a face. There is a good reason people in Iraq, rather than people in Kazakhstan, noticed the Saddam-like image. The Iraqis had seen the dictator's face thousands of times. Their hidden brains had learned to preferentially recognize that face, even in the craters of the moon. Researchers once found that people shown a Lexus whose front grille was turned up in the form of a human smile, with the headlights serving as eyes, liked the car better than when the ends of the grille were turned down in the shape of a frown. As usual, volunteers in the study were not aware that a subtle face recognition bias had influenced their judgment. Many people also show strong, automatic and unthinking preferences for animals that have human-like features. Beluga whales and dolphins with their smooth heads, cherubic eyes and mouths shaped in human-like smiles, are more appealing to us than sea lampreys and octopi. Two dark splotches of fur cause giant pandas to look like they have large eyes, and the hidden brain associates large eyes with babies. It is not surprising that the panda has become a global symbol for conservation. Zoos have to take great care to keep pandas, which can be dangerous, away from people because the hidden brains of zoo visitors tell them that pandas are cute and cuddly. Cartoons routinely show animals whose faces have been anthropomorphized, bears and tigers in children's cartoons not only talk a human language, but have their features altered to look human-like. When we see a mouse that looks like a real mouse and a mouse whose features have been altered to look like a human, our hidden brain places a finger on our internal scale and causes us to find the anthropomorphized mouse more pleasing. We may consciously know that mice are vermin, carriers of deadly diseases, and opportunistic scavengers. But when you widen and move a mouse's eyes from the sides of its head to the front, give it a high wattage smile, and conceal its grubby paws in yellow boots and white gloves, the hidden brain fools us into thinking this mouse is an endearing creature. You don't need a scientific experiment to prove this. Just run to the nearest encyclopedia and look up Disney, Walt. I have spent a fair amount of time on the brain's affinity for faces to show how pervasive the effects of this simple bias can be. But this seemingly innocuous bias can also have not so benign consequences. Experiments show that our unthinking tendency to find baby features adorable biases us to trust adults who happen to have large eyes and cherubic features over adults who do not look childlike, even when the adults with childlike features are liars. The brain's bias for familiar faces also makes it easier for us to recognize those from our own ethnic group than members of less familiar ethnic groups. Our hidden brains arrive in this world with the instant ability to orient themselves in any culture. A Chinese infant born in China will form a preferential attachment to Chinese faces. Through countless encounters with cooing relatives, doting parents and smiling strangers, most of whom are Chinese, the baby learns to make extremely fine distinctions between Chinese faces. People who have little or no contact with Chinese people, by contrast, have a harder time making fine distinctions between Chinese faces, especially in situations that call for rapid judgment. When a Chinese person is asked to spot the difference between two Chinese faces, the mental work is automatic. Such challenges have been encountered so many times that the hidden brain has mastered rules to solve the problem without input from the conscious brain. 
When someone is asked to make distinctions between two people from an unfamiliar ethnic group, the challenge is met by the conscious brain, because it is novel. With effort, the conscious brain of a novice can arrive at the same conclusion as the hidden brain of an expert, but it takes a second longer. Someone who grows up in rural China and is transported to predominantly white Iowa will think most Iowans look alike. But the playing field isn't level. Patterns of global cultural consumption, Hollywood movies, and the spread of American popular culture, mean that people in Ethiopia, Korea, and China are far more likely to have repeated exposure to Caucasian faces than the other way around. I occasionally get mistaken for other Indian Americans at work. It upsets me, of course, and the moment my colleagues recognize the error, they are mortified. I feel that my Indian American colleagues and I look very different, but that is because over a matter of decades I have come into close contact with tens of thousands of Indians and Indian Americans. My exposure to so many South Asian faces has taught my hidden brain to make rapid and fine distinctions among such faces. Mixing up faces of people belonging to unfamiliar ethnic groups does not make us bad people, but it does say a lot about whom we are familiar and unfamiliar with. We are most likely to mix up people when we are stressed or distracted, the conscious mind has its hands full, and the hidden brain leaps to the wrong conclusion. If you believe human behavior is mostly driven by conscious thinking, such errors can produce grave misunderstandings. In 2006, African American Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney of Georgia got furious when a Capitol Hill police officer failed to recognize her. She walked around a metal detector, as members of Congress are allowed to do, and when a white police officer pursued and challenged her, she struck him in the chest. The storyline developed predictably from there, McKinney and several African American leaders said the incident was emblematic of racism in American society and of the extra vigilance that people of color endure at the hands of police. An NAACP leader said the officer had treated McKinney with disrespect. Conservative groups, meanwhile, lambasted McKinney for striking an officer. The following year, McKinney was defeated in her attempt to retain her seat in Congress. If you think about the incident with the hidden brain in mind, you can see how the police officer who failed to recognize McKinney might have been guilty of an unconscious race bias, in that he might have been less likely to make a similar error with a white congressman. Most congressional representatives are white men, and it's a safe bet that most of the people authorized to walk around metal detectors on Capitol Hill are white men. Through sheer repetition, the hidden brains of Capitol Hill police officers will have learned to recognize the faces of white congressmen more or less automatically. Identifying congressional representatives who belong to a less familiar group, African American women, can take a second longer because the mental processing has to be carried out by the conscious brain. The officer most likely intended McKinney no disrespect, and she was wrong to strike him. From the point of view of the congresswoman, I can understand why she got angry. If you are a person of color, the sad truth is that you are much more likely to be the victim of these errors in the United States, even if you are a member of Congress. It feels unfair and is hurtful, and if the incidents happen often enough, your hidden brain comes to assume that the wounds are being inflicted intentionally. McKinney was not responding calmly, rationally, or deliberately. Her hidden brain responded automatically to an insult just as the police officer reacted automatically to an unfamiliar person walking around a metal detector. Like Yago's manipulating unwitting Othello's, the hidden brains in both cop and congresswoman were the real villains of this story. The national commentariat missed the subconscious forces because the commentariat always assumes that words and actions reflect conscious intent, the default position in our society is that the hidden brain does not exist. To McKinney's supporters, the cop had to be a racist. To her detractors, she was a crazy woman who shouted racism, without provocation. A harmless indeed, necessary, bias in early infancy thus creates problems in later life that are maddeningly difficult to control. In criminal justice settings, interracial eyewitness identifications are far more prone to error than situations where witnesses and suspects belong to the same race. Courts dismiss the idea that some eyewitnesses should be taken more seriously than others, because the scales of justice, like Capitol Hill police officers, 
are supposed to be colorblind. Many of the institutions in our society, as I have said, are premised on the notion that deliberate and conscious thinking are all that matter. We assume eyewitnesses who mean to be accurate are accurate. The data, however, prove that unintentional and unconscious bias regularly plays a role in eyewitness errors. Ignoring the role of race, rather than taking it into account, is what produces outcomes that are racist. When do automatic and mundane biases in the hidden brain start to influence our relationships with others? Remarkable research by a Canadian psychologist shows that these biases start to shape our social perceptions and judgment from the time we are toddlers. The Whiteside Taylor Daycare in Montreal is no different from hundreds of other facilities in North America that care for the very young. Infants and preschoolers play, fidget, eat and cry. A few years ago, a psychologist named Frances Aboud visited Whiteside Taylor with an interesting proposition. She wanted to recruit some of the children at the daycare for a psychological experiment. The daycare agreed, and Aboud went about getting permission from parents of the children. When all the paperwork was squared away, Aboud gathered 80 white children from the daycare and from a few local elementary schools. The youngest child she studied was three years old. Aboud, who has sharp, striking features and is of Lebanese descent, gave her young volunteers half a dozen positive adjectives such as good, kind, and clean and half a dozen negative adjectives such as mean, cruel, and bad. Aboud asked the children to match each adjective with one of two pictures. The drawings always showed a white person and a black person. She provided a short explanation of each adjective. She would say, some men are selfish. They don't care about anyone but themselves. Who is selfish, and ask the children to point to the drawing of either a black man or a white man. Or she would say, some women are sad. They are left alone with no one to talk to. Who is sad, and ask them to point to the drawing of either a black woman or a white woman. Aboud also showed the children drawings of a black boy and a white boy and told them, some boys are cruel. When their dog comes to meet them, they kick their dog. Who is cruel? She showed the kids drawings of a white girl and a black girl and said, some girls are ugly and people don't like to look at them. Who is ugly? 70% of the children Aboud studied assigned nearly every positive adjective to the white faces and nearly every negative adjective to the black faces. As disturbing as it may seem, there is nothing unusual about the white side Taylor daycare or the biases of the young children in its care. Similar studies going back many years have found identical results among a range of preschoolers and elementary school children across North America. It doesn't make much difference, by the way, if you allow the children to assign positive adjectives to both the white and the black faces and allow them to not assign negative adjectives to either face. Young children, on average, still assign more negative adjectives exclusively to the drawings of black faces and more positive adjectives exclusively to the drawings of white faces. Research into the biases of young children provides us with a useful window into the hidden brain, because children are rapidly forming associations, and associations are the way the hidden brain learns many of its rules. The doings of the hidden brain, moreover, stand out more clearly among young children than among adults because small kids have not learned to consciously fight the hidden brain's automatic conclusions. But Aboud's work also forces us to think about bias and prejudice through a new lens. It is absurd to think of the toddlers at Whiteside Taylor as hostile bigots. These children were still learning to blow their noses. If we cannot blame the children, whom should we blame? Well, Perhaps the fault lies with the parents or teachers of these children. Where else could they have learned such hateful stuff? To answer that, Aboud assessed the racial views of children at the Harold Knapper Elementary School just outside Montreal. She also assessed the views of their parents and teachers. Aboud found no correlation between the views of the children and the views of their parents. Nor was there a correlation between the views of the children and the views of their teachers. The children were simply not being exposed to a regular diet of hate speech that told them that blacks were cruel and ugly and that whites were clean and good. So where did those ideas come from? Aboud decided to start by understanding what these children thought was going on in the minds of the adults around them. 
so she recruited yet another group of young white children from kindergarten and the first grade. She administered the version of the racial bias test that allowed children to assign positive and negative adjectives to the black or the white face, to both faces, or to neither. Unsurprisingly, Abud found the same pattern of results as in the earlier studies, children assigned many of the negative words exclusively to black faces and many of the positive words exclusively to white faces. Abud then showed the children photos of two research assistants. One was white and the other black. Abud asked the children to guess how the research assistants might assign the positive and negative adjectives to the white and black faces, she challenged the kids to guess the racial views of the research assistants. The children believed that the research assistants would reach exactly the same conclusions they did. They believed that the white and black assistants would mostly assign the positive adjectives to white faces and the negative adjectives to black faces. Abud had the two research assistants visit the children. She had them read stories to the kids with positive interracial themes. She wanted to test the intuitively appealing idea that stories with positive themes would reverse the children's attitudes. The stories were about pairs of black and white friends. One was about two boys named Billy and Carl. Both loved to ride around on their bikes, and both hoped their parents would buy them new bikes for their birthdays. The boys spent time at each other's homes, and were warmly welcomed by each other's families. They confided their hopes about the new bikes to each other. When one of them received a new bike, they celebrated together. When the second boy was not given a new bike for his birthday, he confided his disappointment to his friend. The friends supported each other right up to the point when the second boy's parents got him a surprise present a go-kart. In the final scene of the picture book, the two friends entered a race together and came in first with the go-kart. The story, as you can tell, had unambiguously positive racial themes. Both the friends were warm, caring, and attractive children. They liked each other, and their families liked each other, too. Did it make a difference to the kindergartners? The children loved the stories, but to Abud's dismay, the stories made virtually no difference in their racial attitudes toward black people. Not only did they continue to assign negative adjectives to the black faces, they continued to believe that the research assistants, including the woman who was black, would hold identical views. Another story the research assistants read revealed a surprising twist in the nature of the children's bias. The tale was a fantastic account of three young boys, Alex, Joel, and Zachariah, who were playing on a river in a rubber raft. Alex and Joel were white. Zachariah was black, a serious child who liked books and reading. As they daydreamed, their raft took them out to see where they encountered a crocodile. The beast attacked them and flipped Alex and Joel into the sea. It then came after Zachariah, who alertly used a bandana to tie its snout shut. Zachariah then pulled his friends out of the water and, crocodile in tow, headed back to land. Once on the dock, Zachariah untied the crocodile's snout, even though one of his friends thought the beast should be left to its own devices. But Zachariah knew the crocodile was endangered. As Alex and Joel slept over at Zachariah's home that night, the little black boy stayed up until 11 p.m. writing letters to the president to urge more animal conservation efforts. As you can tell, the little black boy was an unusual hero. Zachariah fought off the crocodile, saved the lives of his friends, was kind to the crocodile because he knew about conservation issues, and sacrificed his own sleep in order to write to the president. But when the researchers asked the kindergartners to describe what they had learned from this and other stories, the children tended to misremember the positive actions of black characters as positive actions of the white characters in the stories. Without being aware that they were doing so, the children stripped Zachariah of his heroism and assigned the credit for his brave and clever actions to his white friends. In other words, Every piece of information that Abud was giving the kindergartners was being filtered through a lens that systematically advantaged whites and systematically disadvantaged blacks. That was so distressing because it was clear the black kid had saved his friends, Abud said. Where were the children getting their obnoxious views? Some of Abud's colleagues suggested that the parents of these children were lying to the psychologist, that they were secretly communicating racist messages to children while pretending to be tolerant. 
Abud thought this was extremely unlikely, if anything, the parents she'd encountered had been worried about discussing racial matters at all out of fear that it might prompt their children to believe that race mattered and eventually lead them to intolerant attitudes. Furthermore, even if the parents had secretly taught their children to be bigots, why would the children believe the research assistants were similarly biased? The research assistants were clearly trying their best to communicate positive things about blacks and interracial friendships. Why were the children hearing something completely different? Abud decided there were two separate puzzles to solve. The first question was, why did the kids believe that the adults in their lives shared their views when they clearly did not? The second question was more basic, how did kids form their racial attitudes in the first place? Hidden in Abud's data was a clue to the first answer. There were differences between younger and older children when it came to how accurately they guessed the views of the research assistants before and after the children heard the positive stories. When the oldest kids heard the white research assistant read stories with extremely explicit and positive interracial themes, they later concluded the research assistant felt positively toward blacks. Their own views about blacks continued to be negative, but for the first time, these kids were able to tell that an adult did not share their views. Frances Aboud was an admirer of the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget, and she thought a piaget yen concept might explain why the youngest kids assumed adults shared their views. Very young children assume that everyone shares their views of the world. It requires a certain level of maturity for a child to realize that people can have entirely different perspectives. This would explain why the youngest children not only believed that the research assistants shared their biases, but why they felt that their parents and teachers had the same attitudes, when in reality all the adults were trying to teach the kids to have positive views about people from other ethnic groups. The children were projecting their own views onto the adults in an immature and egocentric manner. When the research assistants read positive stories to the kids, Abud had assumed, erroneously, that the children would accurately figure out what the adults thought about interracial friendships. But young children find it difficult to infer what is happening in other people's minds. Abud sent the research assistants back into the classroom, but this time, instead of just reading the stories and assuming the kids would draw the right message, the research assistants were told to go out of their way to be explicit about what they took away from the stories. The assistants praised the heroics of the black characters, and explicitly pointed out the warmth of the interracial friendships. When the racial attitude of the kids toward blacks was tested again, the kindergartners now looked a lot like the older kids. They still assigned positive adjectives to whites and negative adjectives to blacks, but they were able to see how the research assistants did not share their views. Parents are afraid of saying anything about race to their kids because they are afraid it will make their children prejudiced, Abud said. I say, heap on the positive stuff. But this still raises the basic question, where did the attitudes of the kids come from? We can confidently say the biased views were not coming from parents and teachers, but we still don't know where they were coming from. Remember, the children did not hold random views on racial matters, large numbers of them, especially the youngest kids, had nearly identical views. They believed whites were good and nice and clean, and that blacks were cruel and ugly and dirty. The answer lay in the different ways the hidden brain and the conscious brain learn about the world. Abud asked me to imagine that I was a young white child who suddenly found himself in an ordinary suburban neighborhood in North America. For the purposes of this thought experiment, imagine that I am friendless and parentless, no one tells me what to think, or what conclusions to draw. I am a child, so I lack the maturity to draw very sophisticated conclusions. What would my hidden brain learn as it tried to make sense of the world? It would conclude, for one thing that most people who live in nice houses are white. Most people on television are white, especially the people who are shown in positions of authority, dignity, and power. Most of the storybook characters I see are white, and it is white children who mostly do heroic, clever, and generous things. My hidden brain, fluent in the language of associations, would conclude that there must be an unspoken rule in society that forces whites to marry other whites, because everywhere I look, most of the white husbands seem to be married to white wives. There also must be unspoken rules about who can visit whose homes, 
because most of the time when friends visit each other, they belong to the same race. In my three-year-old brain, I don't think of black people as bad, but I think of them as different. I might even think they have chosen to be different, that they have chosen to have different skin color, that they have chosen to marry other black people, and that they have chosen to live in black neighborhoods and visit with black friends. Now imagine that I pick up this message not once or twice but thousands of times. I run into exceptions regularly, the black family that lives in the palatial mansion down the street, the interracial couple on the next block, the gay or Latino friends who drop by now and then. But to my hidden brain, which is interested only in generalities, the overall force of the cultural message is overwhelming. My beliefs are inaccurate inferences, but they don't feel like inferences. To my hidden brain, they feel like solid conclusions. Everywhere I look, I see evidence to back them up. Small children who are trying to rapidly orient themselves in the world can draw conclusions that superficially match the facts but are completely wrong. If my three-year-old brain had the verbal and conceptual ability to communicate my conclusions to grown UPS, they would quickly explain to me why I was wrong. But I don't, and in any event, it's no use telling the hidden brain that patterns are superficial, that there really isn't a rule that whites can marry only whites, or that men can fall in love only with women. Remember, the hidden brain has one simple, blunt-edged priority to quickly acculturate us to our world and give us a set of simple tools to enable us to make quick decisions. Many experiments in recent decades have found that black children hold views on racial matters that are more or less identical to those of white children. Black children are likely to associate positive things with white characters rather than black characters. Little black girls may feel white dolls are prettier than black dolls. Educators and parents have tried to expose kids to counter stereotypical books, movies, and images. That is exactly the way to keep the hidden brain from forming the wrong associations, but Francis Aboud's work shows us just how strong, persistent, and explicit the counter stereotypical messages need to be to have any effect. When my own daughter turned three, to cite a personal example, her favorite game was Doctor. Whenever she asked me to play with her, she told me to be the doctor, and she would take on the role of nurse. She was occasionally willing to assume the role of doctor, too, but she would insist we both be doctors. She was absolutely unwilling to let me play nurse. I told her there were no rules about who could be a nurse she was occasionally willing to assume the role of doctor, too, but she would insist we both be doctors. She was absolutely unwilling to let me play nurse. I told her there were no rules about who could be a nurse and who could be a doctor, but it was like pushing a boulder uphill. I finally asked her why nurses had to be female, and she explained, with the calm logic of a child, that she had never seen a storybook where a man was a nurse. If I were to show you a photo of a white man and ask you to imagine what the man's spouse looks like, your conscious brain would tell you the man could be married to a white woman or a black woman, a Latina, or an Asian. He might be married to another man, he might be single. Your hidden brain, on the other hand, doesn't care about the full range of possibilities. When you ask the question, the answer pops right out, the white man is going to be married to a white woman. It doesn't matter to the hidden brain that the rule of thumb is sometimes wrong. The point is that it is usually right, and the answer can be produced at lightning speed. This is why interracial couples in the United States even in this late day and age, attract second glances. When we see a man kissing another man, the preconceived associations in the hidden brain tell most Americans that this is not what men do. Of course, we can quickly shush our hidden brain and act blasé. But when we are juggling many things, when we are under pressure, or when we are simply busy doing something else, it becomes difficult to suppress the automatic associations of the hidden brain. At such times, the hidden brain's rapid conclusions about the world become especially powerful. If we are asked to make a judgment about these men in some other context, their job performance, for example, we may get the feeling they are not quite right for the job without knowing how we leap to that conclusion. When I say we have automatic biases about gay people, I really do mean everyone straight people and gay people. 
just as black children tend to have positive associations with white faces rather than with black faces, gay people can unconsciously harbor the same associations as straight people. This should not be cause for surprise, gays usually see many more straight families than gay families in real life, on TV, and in books. If the hidden brain learns through repetition, why would the unconscious associations of gay people be much different from the unconscious associations of straight people? The picture painted by this work stands in sharp contrast to the conventional way many people think about prejudice. Bias among toddlers is not triggered by a steady diet of hostile messages, or indoctrination by bigoted parents and teachers. It reflects instead that we really have two systems of learning within our heads, that these two systems develop more or less independently, and that we pay almost no attention to one of them. Our society resolutely believes the conscious mind is all that matters, and so all our educational and legal efforts focus on it. We have schools with multicultural messages and rainbow flags. We have organizational experts who preach the importance of sensitivity and understanding. We have laws to punish hate crimes. Many of our interventions are based on the belief that prejudice involves conscious intention or hostility, that it is largely the result of ignorance, and that education is the best way to overcome it. As you can see from Francis Abud's work, each of these beliefs is wrong in a fundamental way. The children at Harold Knapper Elementary were not being taught by their teachers that whites were superior to blacks, all the efforts at the school were trying to communicate tolerance, not prejudice. Separate from what the children were learning consciously, however, they were unconsciously learning something else altogether. What is disturbing to me about Abud's work among the very young is not that children are biased. It is that pervasive bias can occur without anyone, parents, teachers, or the children themselves, wanting it to happen. Everyone involved, in fact, can desperately want the children to reach the opposite beliefs, and the children will still associate positive adjectives with white faces and negative adjectives with black faces. They will misremember the heroics of a little black boy called Zachariah as the heroics of his white friends. And in time, as I will show, children carry these hidden beliefs into adulthood. Some 65 million years ago a giant asteroid hurtled into Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The geological record suggests that the impact triggered dust storms and tsunamis that wiped out many species, including the dinosaurs. The rate of extinction was so dramatic that scientists today call the asteroid impact an extinction event. Interracial friendships between school children in America suffer an extinction event sometime in middle school. Studies show that by the time kids are in the seventh grade, they have far fewer interracial friendships than they did in the fourth grade. Declines in interracial friendships have also been found in many other countries. This isn't just something that happens to white and black children in the United States, the same phenomenon has been documented among Dutch, South Asian and Turkish children in countries as varied as Britain, the Netherlands, and Canada. Like the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs, something seems to happen in middle school that causes children to form in groups and become less likely to form close friendships with children from other backgrounds. This sets the stage for friendships that teenagers develop in high school and beyond. The research findings about childhood friendships is especially depressing because friendship is a magic key to understanding people from other backgrounds. Francis Aboud has found that children who have a close friend from another race, where the children offer each other emotional security, trust, and loyalty, have more positive attitudes toward the other race in general and children who lack such close friendships have more negative attitudes toward the other race. One of the puzzling things about the extinction event in interracial friendships is that it occurs at precisely the time when children are getting beyond simplistic biases. Abud and others have found that by the time children are 7 or 8 or 9, they are able to assign both positive and negative adjectives to people of all races. When the hidden brains of these children come up with simplistic and stereotypical conclusions, their conscious brains are now mature enough to overrule those conclusions. In fact, when Abud had children who were at different stages of emotional maturity discuss racial issues with each other, she found that more mature children invariably debunked the views of children who were still thinking at a preschool level. When a prejudiced child was placed in conversation with someone more mature, 
the more mature child, with the more tolerant views, invariably changed the views of his partner, because mindless heuristics invariably yield to conscious reasoning. Here is one illustrative exchange between two children that Abud studied. G.A., lots of black people, you can't trust them. Like, I had a black friend and he was nice to me, but he's not really nice because he... M.P., does that mean, though, that black people are always gonna be bad? G.A., no, not always. M.P., right. G.A., but some. M.P., only some. Same for whites, same for Chinese. If racism among very small children is largely the result of the conscious brain not being mature enough to overrule the broad generalizations of the hidden brain, why would interracial friendships suffer an extinction event at precisely the point when most children develop the maturity to see that people from all groups have positive and negative qualities? Abud decided to study the question among 240 black and white students at Montreal's Westmount Park Elementary School, a multiracial school featuring large numbers of white, Caribbean black, Southeast Asian, and South Asian students. Her plan was simple, she interviewed students in the fall and again in the spring of a single academic school year and asked the children about their friends. If John reported Dick was his best friend, Abud checked with Dick to make sure he said John was his best friend, too. Abud and her colleagues also asked other students to describe whether John and Dick spent time together, and by comparing these responses, she definitively established which pairs of students were mutual friends and mutual best friends. In the spring, Abud and her colleagues repeated the process. By comparing the results, Abud minutely documented the evolution of same-race and interracial friendships over a six-month period. The changing nature of these friendships was revealing. Nine and teenage-year-old children, as you might imagine, add, drop, and change friends quite often. If you were to look at one set of 25th graders, for example, Abud found about half had a friend belonging to another race. By the second set of interviews, only two of these friendships were still intact. But the same thing was happening with friends belonging to the same race. Perhaps 18 of 20 students had a best friend belonging to the same race during the first set of interviews, and only 10 of these friendships endured over the six-month period. Children were adding new friends at a furious clip, too. But there was a subtle difference in the way they added and dropped friends, different race friends were slightly more likely than same race friends to get dropped, and new interracial friendships were slightly less likely to be formed. The difference would not have been obvious to a casual observer. It might not have been obvious even to parents, because the underlying pattern was hidden in a lot of noise, a cycle of rapidly changing friendships. But the results were hardly subtle. Whereas the youngest children in Abud's group had roughly the same number of same race and different race friends, the oldest children in her group had one and a half times as many same race friends as different race friends. A parent who saw an encouraging racial variety at their child's 7th, 8th and 9th year birthday party might notice a monochromatic racial makeup at their 12th or 13th birthday party and wonder how that happened. When the asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago, it would have instantly killed most terrestrial creatures in the immediate area. But much of the damage to life would have come in the weeks and months that followed. As plant life was choked off by hovering dust clouds, the devastation would have traveled rapidly up the food chain. If you were a dinosaur in what is now Montana, life around you might have declined over several years, not in a Hollywood-style explosion. But slow. Steady declines in habitat and ecosystems can be just as deadly as sudden cataclysms. Many of the hidden brain's most powerful effects similarly involve subtle changes that assume gigantic proportions because they influence us steadily over time. If you were to intercede in a child's life, for example, in order to encourage the child to form more interracial friendships, you would hardly know where to begin. Clearly no individual friendship tells you anything very meaningful, if the vast majority of interracial friendships are lost within a short period of time, so also are the vast majority of same-race friendships. The apartheid model simply does not apply, it is not as if children are being forced apart and taught to hate one another. 
The hidden brain is insidious not because it whacks us on the back of the head but because it places the tiniest of fingers on our inner scales. By the time children are in the seventh grade, those tiny differences leave them with far fewer different race friends than they had in grade four. This phenomenon tells me that the way we usually think about prejudice is deeply problematic. In 2007, for example, the international news media was drawn like honeybees to the story of the Genesis 6, a racial conflict in a Louisiana town that inflamed national passions when white students hung nooses from trees to send a threatening message to black kids. Commentators saw this as a disturbing sign of toxic racial polarization among kids in small town Jenna. The events in Jenna were troubling, but they pale in comparison with the tectonic shifts that happen every day in America's middle schools, earthquakes that go unnoticed. By the time American children are in high school, most are firmly entrenched within their own racial groups, many have forever lost the magic keys of friendship that might have allowed them to understand what it is like to be a person from another race. Nooses hung from trees make for sensational coverage, but they are merely the end product of a process more subtle and more sinister. Our fascination with cases such as the Genesis 6 reflects our bias for stories with easy villains and heroes. When we look for villains in the larger story of prejudice among children, we come up short. What is disturbing to me about the extinction event in interracial friendships among children is that, as with the preschoolers Abud studied, it can occur without anyone explicitly wanting it to happen. The extinction event in childhood friendships turns out to be a natural outgrowth of children's development. Around the time kids are seven or eight, they start to seek out memberships in groups as a way to cement a sense of their own identity. Developing these identities is both normal and important. Racial identity is only one of the many dimensions children gravitate toward. They also start to identify with sports teams, with cultures, and with nations. Researchers in England once had a group of 6- to 7-year-old children and a group of 10- to 11-year-old children think about English people who said nice things about the German soccer team ahead of the 2002 World Cup Soccer Championship. It will not surprise you to learn that the English children generally disliked people who said nice things about the German team. What is interesting and instructive, however, is that the older children were far more likely than the younger children to say that they would exclude traitors from their groups. For the youngest kids, people with contrarian ideas were not defined by their views, for the oldest kids, views about soccer defined who could be in the in-group and who had to be excluded. The extinction event that Abud has studied among middle school children was not triggered by hostility and animosity but by the simple fact that race is one of many categories that define people, and 10 or 11 year olds are eager to start defining themselves. It might be easier to understand this phenomenon if we remove the element of race from the equation. If the work by Abud and others is correct, the same biases that children demonstrate on racial issues should show up for other dimensions of identity. Abud conducted another study on friendships at Montreal's Cortland Park International School. Unlike the school with a large number of students from different races, this school had mostly white children. But it was unique in that it had a large number of children from English-speaking households and a large number of children from French-speaking households. Instruction at the school was in both English and French, at lunchtime on Wednesdays, the school switched all conversation and classroom instruction from one language to the other. The idea was to offer the children an immersive experience in two languages and two cultures. Abud found the same decline in friendships among English and French-speaking children as she had with black and white children at the other school. Cross-cultural friends were more likely to get dropped and less likely to be added, leaving children from the two cultures gradually segregated, in psychological terms, even as their school did its best to physically integrate them. When Abud asked some of the children why they dropped friends who belonged to the other culture, the children said that while they had no personal problem with cross-language friends, it made group activities difficult because there were usually other children from their own linguistic group who had a problem with an interloper. Sometimes no one would actually say anything. But conversation would come to a halt when a child from the other culture joined the group. Children would stop telling secrets mid-sentence. It did not take long for interlopers to get the message. The fact that racial biases occur naturally does not mean they are inevitable. 
what is inevitable is that children will gravitate toward in-groups, but there is nothing to suggest that race has to be one of the dimensions children use to define themselves. If children can be encouraged to form loyalties to groups that transcend race, to a nation or a school or even a sports team, parents and educators can harness the automatic biases of the mind to drive children from different races together, rather than apart. It is fruitless to try to fight bias by telling kids that unconscious attitudes are wrong. What works is to see op the hidden brain in the service of tolerance. Prejudices among children are disturbing, but it is easy to think that cognitive errors in early childhood have nothing to do with our judgments, decisions and attitudes in later life. Thinking about bias in terms of the hidden brain, however, can provide us with what scientists call a parsimonious explanation a single explanatory framework that describes the nature of prejudice across the lifespan, from the very young to the very old. Most of us agree it would be absurd to punish five-year-old children for their biases, particularly when, as we've just discovered, they arrive at those biases innocently, but most of us have no problem blaming adults who display racial prejudice. Small children may not know better, but adults should. Or at least that's what we tell ourselves. So when former Senator George Allen of Virginia called an Indian American Makaka and offered him a welcome to America before the 2006 U.S. midterm elections, those gaffes cost Allen his seat and cost the Republicans control of the Senate, the first pebble in an avalanche that ended in the 2008 elections, where the GOP lost both houses of Congress and the White House. And when Michael Richards, the much-beloved Kramer from the television show Seinfeld, reminded a black heckler at a comedy club that uppity blacks used to be strung up with nooses, he was quickly and publicly censured for his egregious violation of social norms. The subtext of all the ritualistic breast-beating and finger-pointing on talk shows and in op-ed pages boiled down to one simple question, shouldn't these people have known better? The answer to that question is yes, and no. When it comes to prejudice, there are some surprising similarities between the preschoolers that Abud studied and the likes of George Allen. What mostly changes between the ages of 5 and 54 are not the associations of the hidden brain but the ability of the conscious mind to restrain those associations. Researchers once conducted tests that measured the conscious and unconscious racial attitudes of 6-year-olds, 10-year-olds, and adults. They found all three groups had similar unconscious attitudes, they were pro-white. But when the 6-year-olds, 10-year-olds, and adults were asked to explicitly state their views, the 10-year-olds reported feeling less prejudiced than the 6-year-olds, and the adults denied being prejudiced altogether. Were the adults lying when they said they were not prejudiced? Of course not. The reason people consciously reject stereotypes is that they know that generalizations about entire groups are dumb. When we ask people about their views, they tell us what they consciously know. But that doesn't tell us about their unconscious attitudes and associations. Why should adults, who live in the same world as preschoolers, form different unconscious associations? It's not as if adults live in a world where interracial marriages are the norm and there are just as many gay families in the neighborhood as straight families. Why would their hidden brains, which learn through blind repetition and association, arrive at different conclusions? I want to be very clear. I am not saying most adults consciously believe racial or sexist stereotypes. When we are explicitly asked to state our views, our conscious brain and hidden brain sit down for a chat, and our conscious brain wins the debate every time, because reasoned analysis is always superior to dumb heuristics. If the conscious mind is the pilot and the hidden brain is the autopilot function on a plane, the pilot can always overrule the autopilot, except when the pilot is not paying attention. Let's go back to George Allen and Michael Richards. Does the hidden brain explain their outbursts? Let's turn the question around. Let us assume that Allen and Richards did not have a hidden brain, that their comments were the product of conscious intent. George Allen's crack now seems even more peculiar than it already did. Who calls someone a makaka, anyway? If Allen had been consciously trying to slur the Indian American at his rally, he was engaging in intentional political suicide. The young man Alan addressed was taping him on a video camera, and he was working for Alan's opponent in the Senate race. Sure enough, Alan denied being suicidal. 
In his flustered attempt to explain his comments, he said, it's contrary to what I believe and who I am. Likewise, after Michael Richards was excoriated on national television for his comments at the comedy club, he confessed he had no idea where his words had come from. He swore they were at odds with how he really felt. Now let's put the hidden brain back into the equation, and take the conscious brain out entirely. You can actually do this in experimental settings, not through brain surgery but through techniques that distract people's conscious attention and keep them from consciously restraining the automatic associations of the hidden brain. When social psychologists devise such situations, the automatic biases of the hidden brain show up loudly and clearly. Under pressure, the conscious brain can get overwhelmed. Its ability to mask the hidden brain declines, and we observe the beliefs and attitudes we normally conceal. This is why, under the glare of spotlights and cameras, people often say dumb things. It astonishes us when we see small children assign nearly every positive word to white faces and nearly every negative word to black faces, just as it outrages us when a politician or a prominent entertainer, people who really ought to know better, voice hateful ideas. But what is really happening in all these cases is that people are deprived of conscious control over their unconscious attitudes. In the case of toddlers, the conscious mind has simply not developed to the point where it can exert much control over the hidden brain. In the cases of the George Allens and Michael Richardses of the world, stress and pressure can overwhelm the conscious mind and temporarily unmask the hidden associations that lie beneath the surface. People under pressure are more likely to voice hateful ideas and associations, or mix up one Chinese face with another simply because the conscious mind has its hands full and cannot override an autopilot error. Since our entire political discourse is premised on the assumption that the hidden brain does not exist, however, our ability to talk about race in the United States is severely hampered. Take a look at this conversation that Alan had with Meet the Press host Tim Russert about the Makaka comment. I have italicized two sentences. Russert, critics say that Makaka is a racist slur and that you used it because he was dark-skinned. What did you specifically mean when you said, Welcome to America and the real Virginia? Why did you use those words toward a dark-skinned American? Alan, Tim, I made a mistake. I said things thoughtlessly. I've apologized for it, as well I should. But there was no racial or ethnic intent to slur anyone. If I had any idea that, that that word, and to some people in some parts of the world, was an insult, I would never do it, because it's contrary to what I believe and who I am. Russert, well, where'd the word come from? It must have been in your consciousness. Alan, oh, it's just made up. Russert, made up? Alan, just made up. Made up word. Russert, you'd never heard it before? Alan never heard it before. If Alan really did make up the word makaka, he invented a word that happened to have a long and racist history. It's patently unbelievable, of course, but this response was prompted by Russert's argument that Alan must have meant what he said. Russert was saying, if I can show George Allen meant to demean a person of color, that will prove he is a racist. The politician was saying, if I can show I did not intend a slur that will prove I am not a racist. Both men were focused on Alan's conscious intentions. But what if the word makaka came out of Alan's hidden brain? Contrary to what Alan was trying to imply to Russert, he is still responsible for the slur because we are responsible for the doings of our hidden brain. But contrary to what Russert was trying to simply to Alan, the Republican may not have been consciously motivated by the slightest racial animosity. Most Americans think of Allen's comments and Richards's views as abhorrent, and they are. But unpleasant and inaccurate associations lie within all of us, which is why when we see someone slip, our reaction should not be we finally caught that racist bastard, but, there, but for the grace of God, go I. When we focus mountains of newsprint and television time on these incidents, we implicitly set ourselves off as different from the George Allens and the Michael Richardses. We convince ourselves that biased attitudes are the exception, when dozens of research studies have shown that they are really the norm among blacks and whites. I am not saying everyone associates brown people with makaka, 
I had to run to a dictionary myself to find out what the word meant. What I am saying is that we all have mindless associations in our hidden brain that surface when we are not on guard. There can be little doubt that people consciously do have different attitudes and beliefs. This is true of kids, adults, and the elderly. There are people who explicitly feel African and Asian nations ought to be recolonized, that black people in the United States ought to be slaves, and that Jews should be sent to concentration camps. But I believe these consciously biased people are in a very small minority. The disproportionate attention we pay to them distracts us from the far greater challenge, the unconscious biases of the majority, including people in positions of visibility, influence, and authority. One scientist recently showed how the hidden brain is responsible for prejudice among the elderly. William von Hippel at the University of Queensland in Australia found that elderly people were more likely to express prejudice when they had diminished ability to control their minds, in exactly the same way Wendy McNamara became careless about social norms and niceties as her ability to exert executive control was stolen from her by frontotemporal dementia. Prejudice among the elderly, von Hippel found was closely related to the extent of conscious control elderly people could exert over their hidden brain. Elderly people who were more easily confused by distractions in laboratory experiments were also the most likely to express prejudiced views. Many displays of prejudice among elderly folk, von Hippel argued, were no different from the propensity of elderly volunteers to get into quarrelsome arguments when they were tired. Elderly patients were three times more likely to engage in gratuitous arguments in the afternoon than in the morning. In another experiment that I could hardly believe when I first read about it, researchers reduced prejudice among adults by giving them some sugar. Some volunteers were given lemonade sweetened with sugar while another group was given lemonade sweetened with the sugar substitute Splenda. Sugar, of course, rapidly boosts energy levels in the body and the brain, while Splenda does not. The researchers then evaluated the attitudes of the volunteers toward homosexuality. They found that volunteers who got the drink with sugar displayed less overt prejudice than the Splenda volunteers. The brain is one of the body's biggest energy gluttons. If people need executive control to restrain hidden stereotypes, volunteers who got the non-sugar drink had less mental fuel to shackle their hidden brains. The work by von Hippel meshes perfectly with Francis Abud's work among the very young and with a growing body of research into prejudice among adults. Elderly people who have lost executive function behave in exactly the same way as 30-year-olds deprived in experimental settings of conscious control over the hidden brain. The politician in the heat of an election campaign or the entertainer confronted by a heckler in a darkened theater, meanwhile, can be momentarily reduced to thinking like Francis Abud's preschoolers. More and more, I have gotten to think that some part of our brain is still stuck where we were at 4 and 5 and 8, and it is always there, Abud told me. Under stress, people do regress to an early mode. When people cannot control their hidden brains, because they are young and immature, or because they are adults whose minds are temporarily distracted, or because they are elderly and literally losing brain matter, they are more vulnerable to the associations that are always present in the hidden brain. This is why when you ask adults who ought to know better why they said and did certain things, they will tell you they have no idea. We often feel such protestations are disingenuous, but I believe that people are mostly telling the truth when they say they do not hold consciously bigoted views. They are sincere when they report they do not consciously harbor hostility, hate, or malice toward people from other groups. But that does not mean their hidden brain shares their egalitarian views. Thomas Jefferson was a great man, but it is not remotely self-evident to the hidden brain that all men are created equal. This was Chapter 4, thank you for listening. Subscribe for listening more amazing audiobooks like this.